Well, amen. Okay, I'm, I, I hear me now. Good to see everybody here back this afternoon. We'll see. You, you, you know. Well, amen. It's good to see everybody here this evening. Glad you came out back out to the Lord's house. And, uh, good to see our church members here. Good to see those from Philadelphia. Good to see those from Zion Hill. I'm sure there's other churches here around. Um, glad you came. Glad to be in the Lord's house. Isn't it good we can all be together in God's house, worshiping together? So that's going to be when we get to heaven. Nobody's going to say, well, I'm from so-and-so, or I, I believe this like this, or I'm from over there, and I, I'm this. No, no, we all will be worshiping together. Amen. One Jesus, one Jesus. Um, by way of announcements, very briefly, um, briefly, 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 we can miss those tonight. Any, any announcements that are important I need to mention? Excellent. Our prayer request that we added this morning, Miss Vicki Riggins, uh, Pray for her. She's having some troubles uh, this morning. Uh, Billy King, Lynn Brannon, uh, Miss Cindy's back there. Uh, we had uh, Max sitting on one side and Johnny on one side. And Larry was right there rocking the boat, so she's probably wound up again. <laughs> that's right. You the calm part. That's, that's right. Amen. Pray for Miss Cindy. Uh, Bobby Aldridge, Wayne Morgan, Linda Boyette, Brother Pete, Miss Susie Wilson, and the uh, Robert Thrift family. Robert's from Hilliard. Robert's from over in Hilliard. Some of y'all might remember him. Um, worked with him at White Oak. Uh, any others? Tommy Salvi. James Johns. Any other? Amen. 
Amen. What was her name? What was the bay? Amen. Anybody else? Amen. It's good to be in church together. Glad everybody come uh, back tonight. Um, let's pray for our prayer request. Um, we're going to take up a love offering after church at the doors for our music this week. If you'd like to give, please do. I know I forgot to mention it after service this morning, but that's okay. Um, if you'd like to give, please give going out uh, the front door. Brother Ronnie, if y'all can remember, because I plumb forgot. Um, I was so excited about old Kenan getting baptized. Where's he at? Shoo wee. Kenan might be Church of God. Y'all might have taken me off. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Listen, if you ain't ever seen a smile like you saw when he come out of baptism this morning, and listen, um, that's what the Lord told us to be like. That's what the Lord told us to be like. Can you imagine it? Can you just imagine? Let's pray. Lord, thank you today for all your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you look our way and recognize that we need you. So, God, today we just pray that you'll bless us, forgive us where we've fallen short, and, uh, Lord, done things we shouldn't have. Just pray, God, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll bless us anyhow. You tell us in your word that if we confess our sins, you'll forgive us. So, God, we lay those out before you today. I pray, Lord, for those on our prayer list, uh, for the praise reports, for those that need extra prayer today. We just thank you, God. And I just pray, Lord, that, that people open their hearts in here, that, that nobody will give the devil a place in this room. Lord, we'll all turn our hearts towards you and we'll worship in song. Thank you for Isaiah 61 and, Lord, their ministry over the years. And uh, just pray, God, you'll bless them tonight as they sing. Thank you for Brother Keith as he comes. We just know, God, that, that, uh, that you want to bless and uh, you want to be here. So, Lord, as our heart opens up, Lord, let us invite you in. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother. How many ready to make the devil mad tonight? Amen? Amen. All right, here we go. When you're feeling down, kneel down and pray. Kneel down and pray. Kneel down and pray. When you're feeling down, kneel down and pray. Jesus will lift you up. Oh 
the voice Jesus taught the holy word. As men of learning sat amazed at all the things they heard. His family left to go back home, not knowing he had stayed. They weren't aware he wasn't there until the next day. In frustration, Mary found her son and asked him why. He smiled and looked toward heaven, and this was his reply. I must be about my father's business. I'm going to do his will and be a faithful one. I will walk the path he ordained me to follow. I must do his business till he says well
talking about. All right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Bless the Lord. He, he can sing good, that buddy. <laughs> About three years ago, he was nominated in Singing Youth Gospel Magazine as one of the top ten Facebook players in the United States of America. Amen. I'm very proud of him. Thank you for all of us. Good boy right here. Good boy. This is, he got all kind of nicknames. Nate the Great. I call him, you ever see Pinky in the Brain? Y'all remember those cartoons, Pinky in the Brain? <laughs> this is the Brain. <laughs> <laughs> this, this man right here, when he comes to all this stuff right here, I sit down and he takes care of all this. And that's a big burden off me because I used to have to do it and I had to get me saved every night. Amen. But he makes it home in Odom, Georgia, when you make Nathan Scarborough up. <laughs> now remember the woman that had the heaven? Miss Vesta Goodman? This is our version, Miss Vesta. <laughs> This is Ms. Lori Hogger from Townsend, Georgia. My name is Kevin Lane. If you can't remember that, remember Spanky. I'm Spanky from Little Rascal. And this makes up all of Isaiah 61. Amen? Good, good to be here tonight. We're going to sing a song now. I think we are. He's working on some technical difficulties. See, I told you, can't get in the brain. There it goes. How many know if you serve a chain breaking God? Amen. Amen. There's nothing too big or too small, too short or too tall for our God to have. Amen. Listen to Nathan as he sings his first verse on the chain break. <laughs>
we gonna, Nathan, we're going to go to the last song, okay? Because I want to hear my brother preach, man. You need to. Amen. First of all, I've heard you preach. Look, never heard you preach. I'm ready for tonight. Amen. Because, see, there's something about a man of God that just. They'll stand up here flat foot and preach everything. That's right. Now, I am Pentecostal. I'm sorry, no, I ain't, I ain't sorry. I'm Pentecostal. Amen. That don't mean nothing up there. Amen. That don't mean nothing up there. That means I'm saying the same thing to the Holy Spirit. But I love good preaching. Yeah, yeah, this song we picked to sing tonight, we're going to try it out, out on a brand new. It's called The Goodness of God. Sing it, Zach.
I just want to testify that it might not seem much to you, and I, I promise I'll let you away. But our son has been going through a, a, a battle with his ex-wife. That's right. She's threatened this, she's threatened that. And had a granddad. And had a dad. He was going, I know God's God, and I got scared. But it's even flesh. But the day we went to pick her granddaughter up. Yeah. You hear me? He went to pick her up. She didn't eat it. But she's going to have a ring, he had a ring. I don't know if we don't just need to give an invitation. <clears throat> if I didn't light your fire, your wood's wet. If that didn't turn you cranky, you got internal problems. I appreciate the ministry of Isaiah. 61, my first experience hearing them too, and I appreciate the fact that you blend a little bit of the new stuff in with the old stuff. It's all God glorifying, and I love it all, so um, connected with everybody here, I think. We appreciate your ministry. I also appreciate the fact that, um, boy, I've been conflicted about what to preach tonight. I was pretty certain I was on the right page this morning, and uh, I had peace about that, but I've, I've changed... The Lord sent me, a, or I, it ain't the Lord sending me because the Lord ain't the author of confusion, but I've been all over the place about where I'm supposed to be tonight and um, wound up going in a direction I hadn't even considered until this afternoon. I couldn't even take a nap. I was fretting about the message tonight and walked back over to the church and, and, uh, and, the, and the message in the song tonight was confirmation for me that I'm where the Lord wanted me to be. And I can't tell you what that means to a preacher. Um, I got invited to preach one time. At, uh, it was the biggest free will Baptist church in the state over in Albany. A packed house, man. It was, it was a big revival meeting. And, and I had a message that the Lord had, had put on my heart that was only directed at men. And I got looking around in that congregation, and there were more women there than there were, were men. And I, I just plumb got sweating during the music service. They had a special group there that night, too. And I thought, Lord, I don't know what to do now. I feel like I ain't in the right place. And... My, I done got in turmoil there, already nervous about that big church, and it's an uptown church, and I ain't an uptown preacher, so I, I just was a mess, and um, the pastor actually, he said, I'm going to introduce him, and then I'm going to sit down, and they're going to sing one more song, he's going to come up after that, <laughs> and the last song they sang was, Jesus Needs a Few Good Men, and I thought, hallelujah, I'm, a, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, I mean, I, that was all the confirmation I needed to preach then. And so I appreciate the confirmation they've given me tonight. I want to say I, I appreciate my, uh, Ray and I grew up in the same church, Philadelphia, not Philadelphia way up yonder, but Philadelphia down the road a little piece in Folkestone. And um, uh, it's good to have our home church here with us tonight. And, um, you know, they probably thought we wasn't getting a whole lot out of it all them years because we were pretty rowdy and rambunctious and, uh, had fights in the churchyard with green pine cones and everything else, but but they put something in us. It it, it found it took us a few years to to excavate it or for the Lord to excavate it, but it was in us. And people think I'm crazy when I tell them that that the Lord arrested my attention and 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 ransomed my life in 1993, October of 1993. And I've been pastoring the church that I'm at now since October 1995. And people think, you went from where you were. Because I'm telling you, I was lost as lost could be. Uh, uh, to where, to, to pastor in a church in two years. And I, I didn't go to no Bible college. I didn't get, but listen, my mom and daddy and the church that I grew up in put something in me. They instilled, the, I knew what the word of God said, even though I wasn't living it in my life. I knew it. And, um. So I appreciate them being here. Appreciate uh, the church that I pastor. We've got several from Zion Hill tonight, and um, hey, it's a big deal to get them out on Sunday night because we don't have Sunday night services anymore. So they done they done foregone their naps and come out here, and they ain't gonna get to bed early. And um, but I'm grateful for the support that they've given. Thank you for coming back tonight. Um, you know, we all have a tendency when we think about revival. We all have a tendency in our Christian life to go through those highs and those lows. Sometimes we get stuck in those lows a little longer than we need to. Um, but there's an ebb and flow in the Christian life. And when we think of revival, um, we think of just being revved up again. We think of, uh, you know, we may just be coasting along, but revival to us is to get back up on that mountaintop. Revival is 
uh, is to have a rekindling go on in our life. Um, now, I will say this. I read a, I don't know if you've ever read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, but one of the things that he said in there, um, and this was the enemy saying it, <laughs> um, that's a hard book to read, by the way, but nothing pleases God more than when a man not feeling anything, not sensing anything about the presence of God, not seeing the work of God in his life or around his life, for that man to keep on praying, to keep on singing, to keep on reading, to keep on trusting. Um, listen, our faith is rooted and grounded in facts, not feelings. So it's good that we can just press on when we're not feeling nothing. Um, but it's good to feel something too. It's, it's good to be back up on that place where we know that the Lord is at work in our life and be consciously aware of his presence um, in us and around us. Um, working in us and working through us. And so tonight I wanna, I'm, I'm taking a totally different direction from what I intended and totally different direction from where um, I was at this morning. But if you'll turn with me to John chapter 2, I, I want tonight to just help you, I hope. By the way, your revival is only going to get better from this. I know all the preachers coming behind me, so don't quit coming because of me. Come back. That's the benefit of having a different preacher every night. We can... One of us can bomb it, and we can still tell you the next one's going to be better, and you'll come back for some of that. Um, but I, I, I just feel like sometimes in our life, um, we just need a little pep rally of sorts. We need, we need to be pumped up. We need to be encouraged in our faith. Um, and you know those pep rallies in school are designed to unify us, designed to pull us back together, designed to excite us and inspire us. And churches need that sometimes. Christians need that sometimes. We, we need... We need that, those songs that remind us of who we are, remind us of who we are in Him, who He is for us. That's a pep rally. It, it stands us up on our feet and puts a song back in our heart. So I want to I want to have just a little bit of a, a pep rally tonight in John chapter two, um, beginning in verse number thirteen. The Bible says, "And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem." And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, listen, that's a premeditated behind whipping right there. <laughs> he didn't fly off the handle. This is premeditated. When he had made a scourge of small cords, y'all ever, y'all, my mom and daddy cut a many switches. They knew what they was about to do. When he made a score to small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And then verse 17 says this, And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now this one, of the, Jesus actually cleaned the temple twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem at the end of his ministry. Um, but this is an unusual picture of Jesus. It's an intriguing passage of scripture because this is, we almost think that Jesus is out of character here, but he's not. But this is not the Jesus that we're accustomed to seeing. This is Jesus cleaning house in the temple. I mean, this is Jesus going in with a whip in his hand and turning over tables and driving out those people that had made a mockery out of the house of God, out of worship. The place where God put his name was being misused. The place where God put his name was being defiled, and Jesus wasn't having any of it. He drove them out. Now, when he finished the house cleaning, the disciples remembered a prophecy it came from Psalm chapter 69. The Bible said they remembered after they saw that what had been written in Psalm 69, 9. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They identified that prophecy what Jesus had just done. Now what does that mean? What does it mean that the zeal of your house, you might say it like this, the zeal for thine house, hath eaten me up. I think what it means is that 
and they sang it in a song. This is the first confirmation I had in the songs tonight. Jesus was consumed by the Father's business. My zeal for your house consumes me. It's being misused, it's being defiled, and I'm not going to have that. I have a zeal for the Lord's house that consumes me. Now that was true when he was 12 years old. When he had to be about his father's business. And he was in there straightening some folks out then. He was instructing them. He was, he was getting into theology with them. And, and, and listen, that's what he did through his ministry. He was straightening out what they'd made all crooked. He was doing that at 12 years old. 18 years later, he comes back as a 30-year-old and he's back in the Lord's house and the zeal for the Lord's house is still consuming him. So here's what I, when I read that statement, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I'm just going to say it like this. Jesus was on fire for God. He was on fire for the Father's house. He was on fire for the Father's business. He was on fire to do and say and be what the Father had sent him to do and say and be. He was concerned about the spiritual condition of the temple, and his first order of business was to get the junk out and then to restore the temple to the purity of its purpose. Now, let me just say this, and I'm going to go a different direction in just a minute. I'm just laying kind of a foundation right now, but from the beginning... From the tabernacle in the wilderness to the temple that Solomon built to the temple that was built um, in, in Ezra and Nehemiah's days to the temple that is standing right here. That Jesus, the, the temple has always been a type and a picture of Christ. Everything about it. Now I know the book of Leviticus bores us out of our mind, but everything in Leviticus is revealing the holiness of God and all of those furnishings and all of those um, those altars, all of those sacrifices, everything in the temple was pointing us to Jesus. Everything in it was. In fact, if you go and look in, in John chapter 2, verse 19, right, right down from where we just read, <clears throat> they were asking Jesus for a sign, and Jesus answered and said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said, Forty and six years with this temple and building, and you're going to rear it up in three days? What was Jesus saying? You destroy this temple. You destroy my body, and in three days I'm going to raise it up again. So Jesus is identifying himself as the temple. He is the temple of God. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, We are the temple of God. In, in John 14, 12, Jesus says, It's good for me to go away, because um, if I go away, I'm going to send another one to you. And the works that I've done, greater works than these shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. When he sent the Holy Spirit, we became the temple of God. We became the dwelling place of God. God dwells in us. And if we're really on fire for God, if we really have a zeal for the Lord's house, if we're consumed by our, our desire to see the Lord's house purified and fulfilling its purpose, uh, if, we, if we, we, we ought to have that zeal. We ought to have that holy zeal. Um, we need to clean the temple up. Now, I'm going to leave this in just a minute. We're going to go on. But i got to say this. A lot of the times, the reason we get down in them troughs in life and in them low points in life, and we don't feel the presence of God. We don't experience the joy. Um, Romans chapter 14 says that the kingdom of God is, is peace and joy and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Well, if you let your temple get defiled, if you let it get polluted, if you let impurities creep in, it's going to rob you of some joy. It's going to rob you of some peace. It's going to stand in the way of your fellowship with your Creator. And so there, there, there are times in our life when all we need to do to experience revival is to clean the junk out. Amen. Clean the temple. The zeal of the Lord's house is consuming me in fact, I think if you read what happened at the Asbury Revival, a few of those students that stayed around after the chapel service decided that they needed the Lord to do something in their life that involved some cleansing. And when that cleansing came, there was a revival that stirred. 
Hebrews chapter 12 says that we ought to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us so that we can run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Sometimes all we need for revival is just get the temple in order. Clean it up. Get rid of the sin. Get rid of the weight. Get rid of the things that have drug us down and interrupted our fellowship with our Father. When we begin to live our lives with purity and purpose, I believe we'll find again a zeal for God. We'll find a fire for God. We'll find revival taking place in our life. But for the remainder of the message, I just, if, if, you, if you say honestly tonight, preacher, I don't know of anything that's defiling my temple. I don't know of any. God hadn't put his hand on any particular sin in my life. I'm not doing anything that I know is an affront to a holy God. I'm doing the best I can to live a life of purity before him. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. We ought to examine ourselves every day and ask the Lord to do that for us. Try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. Know me. Search my heart. Lord, uh, and if there's anything in there that ought not to be there. Uh, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The temple's clean. The temple's clean. But now what? Now what? Sometimes we just need a, it ain't, it ain't necessarily the temple being dirty. We just need a boost of energy. We just need a boost of excitement. We just need a refreshing and a renewal in our life for the things of God, individually and as a church. Listen, I know I've been in pastoral ministry for 28 years, and sometimes we just get real good at going through the motions. I mean, we just get good at doing the things that Christians do, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. But I'm telling you, if you, if you do that for too long, you, you'll start rusting out. So what do we do to get on fire for God? What do we do to stay on fire for God? What do we do when we need a, a refreshing of our zeal? Now, this is more practical and topical than it is expository tonight. But I want you to just think about that verse. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I'm consumed with that. I'm on fire for God. How do you get on fire for God? Number one, you kindle the flame. Now, I hope and pray that everybody in here has already had their flame kindled. <clears throat> we used to sing a song. In fact, I started to ask Ray if he wanted to get here and sing it. I changed my mind. Y'all don't want to hear that. We used to sing a song, Pass It On. The Lord of love has come to me, I want to pass it. It only takes a spark, get a fire going. Soon all those around will warm up to his glowing. That's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it. Amen. We want to pass that on. So, how do, you, how do you kindle, how do you get on fire for God? You kindle the flame by falling in love with his son. You fall in love with Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm not going to stay here long. But knowing Jesus, knowing who he is, and knowing what he did ought to fire us up every time we think about it. Amen. And I say this to my folks, and I'm going to say it to you tonight. Um, if you ain't impressed by who Jesus is and what Jesus did, there ain't nothing I can say or do that's going to impress you. All right? Listen, the more I think about Jesus, the more I think about who he is, about where he came from, and about what he did, for me and for you, that kindles a flame in me over and over and over again. From the beginning of creation, from the beginning of the Word of God to the end of the Word of God, He is everything that the Bible points to. He, he is the one that God sent to redeem us from our sin. The prophets told us uh, when He would be born, where He would be born, what... Uh, he, they gave us all the particulars, all the wives, all the hows of his life. Over 300 prophecies that pointed us to him. He was born of a virgin, which means Jesus Christ did not in, inherit Adam's sinful nature. Um, he was born, uh, conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. He inherited his father's nature. He lived a sinless life. Um, from the cuddling in that cradle to Calvary's cross, he never sinned. Not in thought, not in word, not in deed. If he had, he would have disqualified himself from being a savior. He did not fall to the temptation of the enemy because he had his eyes set on the cross and the sacrifice that he would make there. He died a sacrificial debt. He paid a debt he did not owe for a debt we could not pay. He, he, was, he, he was buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He took up the life that he willingly laid down for us. 
That's our Jesus. He spent, the Bible said, 40 days showing himself alive by many infallible proofs. He wanted to make sure you know I ain't a ghost. I am I'm alive. I'm risen. I'm the one that you laid in that tomb, and I am alive again, never to die again. Forty days later, he ascended back to the Father with a promise that he had all authority, that he was given that authority to us, that he'd be interceding for us to do what he's called us to do, and that he's coming back again to receive us unto himself, that where he is, we can be also. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If he had not done all of that, every person that has ever been born from the foundation of the world to this day would burn forever in an eternal hell. We wouldn't burn with the zeal of God. We'd burn in a fiery torment. Not one person that's ever walked the face of this earth deserved to go to heaven except Jesus. Amen. Not one not one man, not one woman, not one boy, not one girl would merit eternity with God had it not been for Jesus. Amen. Listen. I ain't never got over what he did for me. And I never will. But now I'll tell you, sometimes i got to remind myself so that I'll fall in love with him all over again. Listen, I went through a season. I used to think people were crazy when they talked about anxiety and depression and all that. I'm like, shake that off, man. Don't let that get you. But I went through a season of some significant anxiety. I'm talking about full-blown panic attacks, get up in the middle of the night and have to walk out of the house. It was awful. I thought about people in my life that I've known that have taken their life because of that, and I thought, I know how they got there. Now, I, I wasn't contemplating myself, but I'm like, Lord, I can't, there ain't no way I can live like this. I could hide it from, from people for a season, but it, when I got by myself and at night, it was awful. But let me tell you what I did. The Bible says this in Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. Let me tell you what I did. I'd go to that church and I'd walk around that building and I'd sing them Jesus songs. I'd sing about him. I'd sing how great thou art. I'd sing, oh, what a savior. I'd sing because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And I feel that anxiety begin to melt off of me and the peace of God come back in and fill my heart. Listen, you just might need to fall in love with him again. You might need to get back at his feet and worship him for who he is and for what he's done to you, for you and to you. Listen. Kindle that flame over and over and over again in your life. Fall in love with the Son of God every day of your life. Remind yourself of who He is and what He's done. After you kindle that flame, you need to keep some fuel to it. You need to add some fuel to the fire. Fall in love with the Word of God. Now, I, get, I know this, that Jesus Christ Himself was... The living word. He was a walking, talking, living Bible for us. But he's also left us this word. This word. We need to fall in love with it. It's, it's, it's milk for us. It's meat for us. Jeremiah said when he tried to keep quiet that the word of God was like a burning fire that was shut up in his bones. We, we need, if, we, if you want to fuel the flame that Christ has kindled in your heart, you got to get in the book and stay in the book. It is, it is the fuel for the fire that he set in us. I can tell you what it'll do. It'll wash you. It'll wash you. Jesus said that he loved his church and he gave himself for it, uh, that he might wash it with his word and present it back to himself, a spotless bride. Listen, when you get in the word, he washes you. When you get in the Word, He purges your life. He convicts you of sin by reading this Word. Uh, and the Holy Spirit takes it and empowers it. And it comes alive within us. It'll fuel that, it'll fuel that flame. If we're going to get on fire for God and stay on fire for God, we need to fall in love with this old book. I dare say most of us got multiple copies of it at the house. 
probably several different translations at the house. Got it on our smartphone. We got more access to the Word of God than we've ever had in our life before. These people on the other side of this planet that give our life for a page out of it. And we got it sitting on our coffee table. Let me tell you, I, I shared my testimony online the other day. The night that the Lord arrested my attention, the night that I, I, my wife finally said, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you got to get up out of this bed and, and go sit in that recliner because i got to get some sleep, and you flopping like a fish. Man, I was under such conviction, I couldn't stand it. She didn't know what was going on in my heart, but let me tell you what I did. I, I saw that old call, that Bible laying on that coffee table, and all I did was open it up, and I read a half a verse, and the Spirit of God broke my heart wide open. It, this book is alive. It's powerful. It'll convict you of sin. It'll wash you of it. It'll encourage you. It'll strengthen you. It'll remind you who Jesus is and what he's done. Fall in love with it. Listen, I believe we ain't spending enough time in it. I, I don't, I've been preaching it pretty hard for 28 years, and I ain't even scratched the surface of what God's got in it. I get study in my office sometimes and pick my feet up off the floor in that old spinning chair of mine and spin myself around and say, whoa, God showed me another nugget of truth I didn't ever know before, and I can't wait to share it with somebody else. Fall in love with the Word. Now, I, I, I got I'm, I to move on for this. But, but, but do, you, do you love the book? Can you prove it by how much time you spend in it? <laughs> no, I told my wife I love her, but I didn't spend no time with her. She began to question that. But you ain't, listen, you ain't got to spend hours every day in the book. I found this to be, I, I get, I, if you own one of them one, read the Bible in a year, reading, listen, I done tried that several times. It don't work for me. I get Leviticus, boy, I'm done. I, I'm like, you, I got to read something to get my interest a little better than that. You know, I found the most productive Bible reading for me is just take a verse or two every morning and ask the Lord what he'd say to me from that. Lord, what does that mean for me? I, I, I know you wrote it to them at a certain time. You try to lay it all out in context, see what's going on around it. What's that mean for me? You'd be surprised at the number of times during the day when you do that, that God bring that word back to your mind and will use it in your life or in the life of somebody else's. You ain't got to read a whole chapter. You got to read a whole book. You ain't got to bog yourself down. You ain't got to wear yourself out. I'd rather, I'd rather you read one or two verses and have an understanding of it that you can apply to your life than I had you read 10 chapters and go brag about reading 10 chapters that you can't tell nobody anything about. Read a verse or two of scripture that primes your pump, and then you pump it all day long until you start getting some of that life-giving water from it. It's a funny story. I was reading my devotion. It's been three or four years ago, um, one morning, and, and it got me on it. You know, sometimes you go chasing them cross-references because it gets exciting. You know, you go to this one, go to that one. And I don't know how I did this, but I stumbled up upon it was Bible trivia stuff. And um, when, I, when I stumbled on it, I just had to research it for a minute, you know. I found out Psalm chapter 117, the shortest, verse in the, or shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm chapter 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm chapter 118 is the dead middle ver uh, chapter in the Bible. Right smack dab in the middle of the Bible. There's an equal number of chapters before it and after it. Chapter 118 verse 8 is the middle verse in the Bible. And it says something along the lines of it's better to put your confidence in God than in men. And I just thought, that's cool. That's a good verse for God to put right in the middle. He did that on purpose. And about four or five hours later, a college kid called me, and she's like, hey, I need, an, I need, I need your help. And I'm like, with what? I ain't no college kid. And she said, I, I've been assigned to write an essay. And she said, I want to bring some Bible into it. The value of faith, and um, and she talked about some of the things you know. She said the value of faith um, for for like health needs or for defense or you know, what's the value of faith in everything that we face in life? I said I got one for you. She said what? I said one Psalm one eighteen verse eight. <laughs> for it's better to put your confidence in God than in man. And she's like, man. You came up with that right off the top of your head. And I'm like, I did. Because I, did. I didn't tell her I just read it that morning. 
But let me tell you what, this is how God works. God knew she was going to call me. He sent me on a little Bible trivia chase so I could be a help to her. And then I got a little bit of a big head cause of it, but you'd be surprised at the number of times during the day that God will use what you read that morning to feed your soul or use you to pour out somebody else. And if you'll do that, if you'll make it a practice of doing that, let me tell you something, the Bible reading will become exciting for you again. Don't read it until you're about to go to sleep. Don't read it until, don't, don't read it, don't use it as a melatonin. I guess you can if you want to, but you ain't going to get much out of it. It don't go in you through osmosis when you lay your head on it. You've got to read it and study it and apply it for it to be, for it to be milk and to be meat for you. Do you love the book? Can you prove it by how much time you spend in it? When you read it and it speaks to you, do you obey it? I don't believe God's going to give us any more than what we're already applying. You know, I, it's kind of like that whole addition, subtraction, multiplication. If you don't know how to add and subtract, you ain't going to learn how to multiply or divide. And so sometimes God, God will just say, I ain't going to give you anything else until you apply that. That's why we get stuck. Fuel the flame. Fall in love with God's word. Fan the flame. Fall in love with God's work. There's nothing else that you'll do on earth that'll endure forever. But God's work. I think it was Jim Elliott that said, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Fall in love with God's work for you in the world. We fall in love with a lot of stuff that one day every one of us is going to lay it aside and leave it behind. That's why Jesus said, don't lay up treasures on earth. When you lay up treasures on earth, the moth, the rust, the canker, it's going to eat it up, it's going away, you can't take it with you, none of it going with you. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Do the work of God, that's what counts. That's what counts now in the lives of, of other people, and that's what counts for all eternity. Fall in love with the work of God. The work of God will endure forever. It is the highest, holiest calling on this earth. And he's called all of us to do it. He's made all of us his ambassadors. When you, when you, when you talk about the work of God, I don't believe there's anything more exciting. There's nothing that brings you more joy. There's nothing that brings you more satisfaction. There's nothing that brings you more reward here or in heaven above than doing the work of God on earth. And I can tell you what that word is in a work, and, and, and what that work is in one word, evangelism. That's it. Everything you do is about evangelism. Listen, God doesn't made you perfect in Jesus. You are. Positionally, we're going to stand before God perfected, blameless, holy. I, don't get, I, don't, I can't hardly wrap my mind around that because I know I ain't that practically. But positionally in Christ, I got everything I need to stand in the presence of God and be holy and blameless. So why we need to clean up our life on earth so we'll be a good witness of what God's done in our life. Everything that we do is about evangelism. The apostle Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I, I, Ray's had an evangelistic heart for as long as I've known him. And I believe he's got a gift of evangelism. But I think God is calling all of us to evangelism. We might not all do it the same way. We might not all be so bold in our witness. Um, but if you'll go out and live for Jesus every day with the intention that you want to point somebody to him so that they can know what you know about him and trust him as their Lord and Savior. If you'll go out every day and do your very best to fulfill that purpose, you'll find more joy, more satisfaction, and more reward in this life. It'll fan that flame that God set in in your heart, it'll make you want to do more for him. Amen. Chris, my son-in-law, is our youth pastor, and he prayed a prayer a few weeks ago. He said, just asking the Lord to give him opportunities. Now, I know y'all scared to pray that. Some of you are. But if you, if you spend enough time in the Word, every, every Christian in here ought to have a Romans road memorized. Right. Right. Every Christian in here ought to have it memorized. You ought not even need a Bible to tell people what the Romans road says. If our sole purpose is to try to win somebody to Jesus while we're here, and I, I honestly believe that's the only reason he left us here, is to, is to populate the kingdom by our witness. Otherwise, he just, if he, he just took us on to heaven.
saved us and killed us at the same time. I, sometimes I think he might ought to do that. Evangelism is the work of God, and every part of our life ought to revolve around God, give me an opportunity today to be a witness. And don't be surprised if somebody don't pull up a chair and sit down and say, tell me about you, Jesus. If you want your life to glow hot with the glory of God, then get busy doing something in Jesus' name. You know, they, they, they came to Jesus one time and found him with that. John chapter 4 is one of my favorite chapters when you talk about personal evangelism. That woman at the well. You know, the disciples went in town to get something to eat. They was all hungry. And they came back, and, and Jesus had just led that woman literally in a soul-winning conversation. You came here to draw some water from that well, but the water that I can give you is going to be in you a wellspring of life. That woman left the water pot. She forgot why she even come to the well. She went back to the city and said, I done, talk, I done found a man told me everything. Of, he, he knew stuff about me he ought not to know. I have found the Messiah. And they came back and found Jesus, and they're like, Lord, we got some... Here's some bread and here's some meat. You know what he said? My meat to do the will of the Father that sent me. I got some meat to eat that you don't know nothing about. I got some water to drink that you ain't experienced yet. But I'm going to tell you, when you start doing the work of God in evangelism, intentionally trying to reach somebody for Jesus, you ought to have a list at your house with somebody's name wrote on it that you know is lost and do everything in your power to introduce them to Jesus. Determined to burn out, not rust out. And here's the last thing. Keep the flame by falling in love with this church. Listen, there's a lot of people saying a lot of bad things about the church. And I know the church is flawed. I know we ain't perfect. I know there's some... We've had some hiccups and some stumbles and some falls along the way. I know there's some things that we need to step up and, and, and admit, and take responsibility for in them failures. But the fire God set at Pentecost, still burning in the church. It ain't burnt out. The church has kept the flame. Why should you fall in love with the church? Because this is where the work of God is performed by the people that make it up. Listen, we come in here and learn and grow and mature so that we can be witnesses. We come in here and the Lord cleans our lives up, sanctifies us and makes us holy, sends us out those doors to be a witness in the world. We come in here and, 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 and hear good uh, worship-filled music and the presence of God fills this place and fills our heart and we walk back out of here with the joy and the peace and the righteousness of God uh, just exuding from our lives and people look at us and say, what's wrong with you? Let me tell you about a man. Why fall in love with the church? Because the church is still doing the work of God in the world. It is the church for which he died. He wrote this book to the church. All those epistles in the New Testament were written to the church. He left us behind. Jesus said, when Peter said, um, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, 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 and Peter, uh, Jesus told Peter, and upon that rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The work of God is performed by the people who make up the church. Atheists ain't evangelizing. Well, they are, but they ain't evangelizing the right way. Agnostics ain't evangelizing. Buddhists ain't evangelizing. Muslims ain't evangelizing. They can't none of them evangelize because ain't none of them got the truth. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. And we do the work of God in the world. Where God is at work in the world, the church is at work in the world. Fall in love with the church because the word of God is preached in the church. It is the ministry of the church to proclaim the truth of God's word. Fall in love with the church because the son of God puts his spirit in every member of the church. There's no other place or organization on earth that a child of God should be more in love with than the church. Now listen to me. I... I ain't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get up on this soapbox and stay there. But you ain't the church. You part of the church. 
you a member of the church, but you ain't the church. All these folks sitting home and don't want to come to the house of God to worship, to study, to fellowship. They continue with one accord in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking the bread and prayers. Now, you might sit at home and engage yourself in studying the apostles' doctrine. You might sit at home and pray. You might sit at home and break bread, but you can't sit at home and fellowship unless something's wrong with you. You fellowshipping with yourself. Fellowship is koinonia. It is calm. It is togetherness. It is, it is God's idea. It is God's command for the church to gather. There's no place on earth that we ought to be more in love with. And I'm going to just say this. I don't believe there's any place on earth that's closer to heaven than the gathered church singing and praising. Now, ain't nothing looks more like heaven on earth than when the church gathers in Jesus' name. I believe your connection with other believers is one of the keys to keep the fire burning in your heart. Y'all heard the story, I'm sure, about that old pastor that went and visited the church member that hadn't been around for a while and he's sitting in front of her fireplace. And he just get, grabbed one of them burning red coals with a fire poker and drug it away from the fire a little bit and went in just a few minutes. That, that glowing ember faded away to nothing. I'm going to tell you something. You separate yourself from the church. You're going to find your fire getting weak. You're gonna fi- you, 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 you'll find your faith getting weak. You need the church. If this is the church that God's called you to, it needs you to be on fire for God in it. It needs you to be on fire for God in it to make it better, to make it more effective. We don't need any more dying embers. We need some fired up members Amen. burning with zeal for God. I got an old Kentucky friend, I, and I love to preach for him because he talks that. He's been washed in the blood. <laughs> been washed in the blood. Went and sang for him, or went to preach for him one night, and they sang power in the blood. Scared me to death. He was standing right next to me, and when you get to the power and the blood part, they say, he says, there's power, 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 power. I'm like, I jumped back, and I said, y'all got fully automatic power in here. <laughs> we, we, we just got the pump action variety. We just got power, power, you know. But, but he, he said, he'll t- he tell me all the time before I get it to preach, he said, just beat the brakes off. You don't need no brakes. Just beat the brakes off. And let it roll. Hey, I'm telling you not, beat the brakes off for Jesus. Just beat the brakes off. Run hard for him. Give it all you got. Get on fire for God. Fall in love with his son. Fall in love with his word. Fall in love with his work. Fall in love with his church. I promise you. You'll find what you're looking for. If you want to be on fire for God, that'll do it for you. I believe when an individual or church gets on fire for God, the world's going to come watch it burn. They will. When we get on fire for God, the world will come watch us burn. Some of them are going to get a little too close and catch that's the goal, amen? That's the goal. I remember Ray telling, telling the story. I've told it at our church a hundred times about Coach Pitt asking him that question. I want to know what makes you tick. You know what that means? What, what you so all fired up about? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let the zeal of the Lord's house consume you. Let the zeal of the Lord's house make you the witness that he's called you to be. Can we stand together? I'm going to ask Brother Ray to come stand up front. Maybe you just want to come pray. Listen, there may be one of them areas in your life where you just kind of, you let the fire go out. You let the love die. Jesus told that first church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation. They, they've done a lot of good now. He bragged on them. But he said, I got somewhat against you because you left your first love. You know, it's, 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 it's easy for us sometimes to walk away 
to get cold and indifferent. We can, we can get cold and indifferent about who Jesus is and what he did for us. We can take that for granted. Or we can rekindle that flame. We, we, can, we can just take this book and lay it up on the nightstand and content ourselves with never reading it and listening, letting Ray feed you once a week. But Jesus said, don't, don't, don't leave your first love. Come back to it. Repent and do the first works. And I can tell you what happened when you got saved. You was in love with Jesus. You was in love with the book. You was in love with the work that God was doing all around you. You was in love with the church. All that was true when we got saved. And I think that's all revival is about, is coming back to those things. Let the zeal of the Lord's house consume you tonight. Amen. As we get ready to pray, I, let's have a word of prayer real quick. While we're praying, I want, you to, I want you to visualize yourself. Visualize yourself looking inside and finding anything in there that's keeping you away from being right. Visualizing your life. Right with God again. You, you say, well, brother, I don't, I don't drop the ball. I don't, I don't. Listen, you know, you know where your heart ought to be. You know where it used to be. So as we pray, do some work with the Lord. Do that, do that with God now. And when we stop praying, I'd like our men, listen, come pray. Come pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for this dear brother who's come preached your word, God, unapologetically. I thank you, God that there's fire. I thank you, God, that the church is, is alive and well. I thank you, God, that you've made a place where we can come learn about you. We can exhort you. We can praise your holy name. That we can, that we can come and, 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 and fall in love with the people there, God, and have grow friendships that we never thought we'd have. We thank you, Lord, for the church. So, God, I pray that you remove anything in anybody's life tonight, Lord, that might impede their worship, their praise, and their fellowship. God, I pray that you move those things out of their life. God, make it evident in their own lives so they can be right with you once again. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'd like to come, please do. Now's your chance. Now's your time.
get in close to those services where people don't want to go home. And I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed church. Um, enjoyed being in God's house, and I, I feel revival. You know, I feel I feel revived. I feel like I feel like we're we our church personally have has been the past three four months has God has just gradually and uh, tooth and nail because sometimes we don't want. Listen, Brother Billy, sometimes we don't want revival because we know, we know there's a, uh, something has to take place, uh, a reckoning for revival. And God's been pulling us along. And I can see him pulling different ones. He's pulling different ones, you know. And then as he pulls them along, then they start pulling. They don't have to be pulled. They're pulling. And, and boy, I tell you, I, 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 can't, I brag on our men all the time, but I, I've, never, I've never seen it like this. I never seen it like this, Keith. Uh, Forty men with a, with a phone text. Forty men are on their knees praying. Forty men. I brag on those forty men everywhere I go. I said, a man told me, I want you to pray for me. We got to preach Wednesday night to pig pens up there in, in Perry. Man come to me uh, Friday morning early. He said, I need to talk to you about what you preached we, uh, Wednesday night. I thought he had a problem. You know, I thought... Get my stuff situated here in case he throws me around in the parking lot. You know it. He said, he said, you made a comment about men ought to be accountable for their households. That it wasn't, that it wasn't your responsibility to teach about Jesus. It was my responsibility. Amen. He said, man, you broke my heart. He said, man, I, he said, I wasn't no good yesterday. He said, I want to come tell you today I appreciate that. Listen, hey, we have a responsibility to kindle that flame in our house. To, to, to live a life pleasing to God so that so these kids see it. You know, that, that you don't have to preach at them. Just live it. You don't have to preach at them. Just, just, just live it. They'll want that too. Amen? You'll be surprised. Be surprised. Thank you, Keith. I, I appreciate it. And your dear wife, Miss Cindy, she's always been way better than you. Now, I just, I'm just throwing that out there. And I appreciate you. And uh, his mom and daddy. You talking about growing the church and things sticking to you. Aunt Doris, I remember the felt boards, you know, in all the days. And you might not, the little, when we got, a, we, got the, we got rich, we could get that little thing you could put your face up to. And you could, you could look at the, and the screen didn't move, but you could look at it in there. I remember that. I remember that. I remember those days. It, it, it didn't return void. So the passion that we have to preach and to go tell people about what God, we, we, these are the people. These are the people right here that did it, that put it in our lives. And now it's our goal to put it in their lives. And, and we don't need to let them down. Look at all the kids. Look at all the kids. Look, I don't mind painting this building every year. But look at all the kids. God's got, God's got to work here. I just pray that, that God will bless you. Come back tomorrow night. We'll have church tomorrow night too, amen? And, uh, and uh, you can sing that last song. I forgot the name of it. What was it? You can sing that every night, bless my heart. Amen. <laughs> Praise us. You'll sing it tomorrow? Thank you. Man, that's a good one. Uh, amen. But uh, look forward to coming back tomorrow night. I pray all of you are able to come back. I know a lot of you got things to do, and uh, you won't be able to, but, but, but spread the word. If you want revival, be here in God's house. It's up to you. You can have it if you want it. You can have it if you want it. Anybody have anything to say before we dismiss? God is good. We're going to take up a love offering at the back door for our music this week, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to ask Brother Billy Champion, pastor at my home church, Philadelphia, if he would dismiss us in prayer.